Hello and welcome to the Somerset Archaeological and Natural History Society, which is usually known as SANS. My name's Lizzie Indooney and I'm the current chair of SANS. This evening we have another double act with David Dawson and Oliver Kent, who will be discussing the remarkable collection of pottery discovered during excavations at Wells and Mendip Museum in the 1990s. Oliver is a freelance archaeological ceramic specialist and has been working on the Wells Garden finds since 2021, when he began cataloguing the um, Chinese export porcelain. His particular interests are um, in post-medieval ceramics and early ceramic technology. David Dawson has a lifelong interest in archaeological pottery and he and Ollie co-organised the Bickley Ceramics Project, which investigated how pottery was made and fired. Since his retirement, he's been able to focus on medieval and later pottery studies in relationship to Somerset. As usual, Oliver and David will take questions at the end of the talk. To ask any questions, you'll need to activate the chat button at the bottom of the page and type in a question. To find a signal button, uh, you just run your mouse over the bottom of your screen and a series of buttons should pop up. If the button's not there, it might be at the top right or even hidden under three dots. Because we're recording this lecture, we won't use names in the question time. It's free to register for the talks, but a donation of £5 towards the ongoing costs of sounds would be greatly appreciated. The donations button is on the SANS website webinar donations page. When donating, please label your donation smashed in the cellar. To make things easier, a link to the donations page will also be posted on the chat button at the end of the lecture. So over to Ollie and David. Oh, good evening, everyone. Hi. Um, I'll just get the screen started. We're here this evening to um, discuss a, a remarkable exhibition. You have until the 11th of April, the end of play, to um, go and visit this exhibition at the Wells and Mendip Museum. And we would re thoroughly recommend that you do so. So we'd like to uh, introduce you to this project, um, which uh, wouldn't have been possible were it not for the uh, funding that we have received from Arts Council England and the National Lottery Heritage Fund. It was Vicky, I, Vicky um, Dawson, our project leader, who had the idea of actually building on something like eight, eight years worth of um, research into the collections here that um, prompted uh, what you will go and you will be able to see. We were able, with the, the extra funding, to uh, commission Duncan Cameron as our, our, our artist in residence. He has contributed artwork of his own, like the little ship that you see here. And also he's engaged with local community groups like Heads Up and the Lawrence Centre, who have also contributed work to the exhibition. We've been able to engage the services of con conservators Richard and Helena Jeska, who have made an enormous amount of difference in being able to help us piece together and clean um, pieces of um, uh, ve vessels, like pieces of pottery, like the the uh, crane plate that you see here, which was covered in dirt. We've also been able to engage Ollie um, to research the Chinese export porcelain that was recovered um, and to author the booklet that is available here, five pounds from the museum shop in Wells. And of course, we've been able to, it, it's enabled us to get together this exhibition uh, with the help of the Southwest Heritage Trust, who lent us the uh, exhibition system, and also to pay for the loan of this lovely painting 
by Richard Collins of the family at T, lent by the work Worshipful Company of Goldsmiths. So without these, these um, Arts Council grants, and I have to say too, the support of a small army of volunteers who've acted as uh, stewards um, for the exhibition and helped at various stages throughout the last eight, eight, ten years um, in the processing of the vast amount of material that we're going to be talking about. And the core of this lies in the house. This is the house that, that, that um, the museum now occupies. It was purchased in 1928 by William Wyndham. And it enabled uh, Bolch, Herbert Bolch to move the collection out of the rooms it occupied above the cathedral cloisters into this lovely building, which, as you see it now, was extensively remodelled by a former tenant, Joseph Lovell Lovell, in the 1820s. Now, we'll be returning to him a little later. However, its use as a museum really um, became incredibly constrained by the time we got into the late 20th century. And the trustees and managers determined on adding uh, new accommodation, one for the collections, a uh, proper reserve collection store, which was to be located at the bottom of the garden that you see here. And secondly, to build a, an a, a, a learning centre where uh, um, school parties, local societies and so forth could meet. Now, that at an, an archaeologically sensitive site, um, like the one occupied by this house, um, meant that the trustees and managers had to organise archaeological excavations in advance of the work. And this is the extent of the excavations, as you can see in the end of the 1990s, in this shot taken from the museum attic. I hasten to emphasize that it is common archaeological practice to only excavate that part of the ground surface that is going to be uh, extensively removed or uh, disturbed by any new work. And so you can't, it isn't a matter of just digging where you fancy. And um, certainly here, one of the places we did would have fancied is actually digging um, this structure that you can see um, extending across the, the site from east to west to really determine what it was. But nevertheless, um, the site actually was a very complicated one. You can see from this section in the lawn of how shallow the um, uh, stratigraphy was overlying the mo majority of the site, how much the land has been built up to level out the lawn that you see here. But you'll also notice that there are some quite substantial areas which are pits. Pit six over this side here, which was dug to provide a a driveway to the storage area at the rear um, it turned out to have been backfilled in the early 14th century. But the, <clears throat> the majority of pots that we would like to show this evening actually come from this complex of pits, pits form five and associated structures over on the west side of the plot. Now, I must emphasize that all the pottery we've recovered here was in bits. There are only about one or two pieces out of the best part of 400, 500, 600 that weren't in fragments. So the original excavators, um, Simon and uh, Christopher and their uh, team, actually spent some time trying to piece together uh, quite a lot of the pottery they had excavated. But in the end, uh, this was in preparation for a post-excavation scheme that they put to the lottery fund 
uh, which unfortunately was refused because the lottery fund by that date had changed their criteria, which is a great shame because what it meant was that this collect vast collection of ceramics actually languished for quite a while until um, Linda Iverson, Teresa Hall and myself, uh, together with uh, Barry Lane, took up the challenge of actually trying to make sense of it all. Um, quite a job. I don't, th as Linda said, I thought we were taking on a, 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 a project that was going to last a few weeks, not, not eight years. Anyway, we've published um, the medieval pottery, as you see here at the top, in um, the Sands Proceedings for um, 2015. And also a smaller group of um, later pottery, early se late 17th century pottery from Pit 13. But we'd settled down to trying to um, publish the red earthenwares um, from Pits 4 and 5. And to get, give you an example, here are two vessels from that. Um, the earlier Pit, Pit 6, beautiful copy of a Saint-Ange wine jug. And a copy, uh, this was made at Redcliffe in Bristol. And here we have a, a, a big storage jar made of a more local fabric. Two pots in front of them, you can see are from that little um, 17th century group. Uh, a rare and Krug, the kind that you would be familiar with if you study Bruegel's paintings. Uh, and... This little, lovely little cup, which is um, one of two, um, <clears throat> made, and we can identify the fabric at uh, the South Somerset Pottery. Uh, sorry, the East Somerset Potteries. That is at One Stroke, Trudix Hill, and Nunny. The two other vessels that you can see here are from Pits 4 and 5. They include this nice festival um, stoneware chamber pots with the two lions. And this lovely little uh, other chamber pot uh, with scraffito decoration, you see the tulip um, made in South Somerset, near Donyet. So <clears throat> we had the opportunity then to try and make sense, which is what we've been doing, of uh, finds from pits four and five, which were mostly found back, 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 back filling a cellar in the garden here and an adjoining cellar that um, doesn't seem to have a, a, a discreet roof. And literally, uh, there are something like 800 individual vessels represented in this mass of pottery that we have been struggling with for, as I say, eight years now. And it's that collection of pottery that forms the core of the exhibition. Now, I must emphasise that we are not dealing with, with, with these pots. We are not dealing with pots that uh, are in, in any way an intellectual construct. These are pots that were found in the, on the site. They were presumably disposed of um, because they were used, uh, uh, but got out of use, of people who actually lived on the site and made, had a use for them. That's quite important because I know we get rather used to these days to scenes like the one on the left here, which are purely intellectual constructs. Excellent research um, to be true. You, you quite commonly see in uh, National Trust houses, but nevertheless are what people now think were was um, representative of the time of the context in which they appear. Ours are of the time that um, the context in which they appear. And what we've tried to do is to make sense of that. So it's a little bit different from, I can see it's part of the challenge here in this reconstructed interior from Cottles Barton, which is collected by Torquay Museum. It's the complete interior of a, of a 19th century kitchen. Not many pots in evidence, you'll notice, but an awful lot of metalwork and woodwork and other other material. 
But the strange thing is, in the for the excavations um, from pits four and five, there wasn't very much other material other than lots and lots, hundreds of sherds of broken wine bottles. What do you make of that? I, I leave to your imaginations. It did, however, contain some weird anomalies. Most of the clay pipes, they've been studied by Marek Lucan, a date from the late 17th and very early 18th century. There's nothing later, although we know that clay pipes were commonly in use right up until the uh, 20th century. Similarly with the glass, the dining glass, there's a marvellous collection of, small but marvellous collection of late 17th century drinking glasses of uh, national importance, we are told by Colin Brain, who is the expert on such things. The toothbrushes, perhaps not surprisingly, are the early 20th century from various dental suppliers in Bath. But Ollie will be telling you a little bit more about those later. The majority of the material is pottery. Pottery in all sh shapes and sizes that we have to made, try and make sense out of. Now, we're not... In the original um, scheme of publication, the idea was to do the normal archaeological thing of actually lumping together all the red earthen wares, all the stone wares, all the Chinese por export porcelain, and et cetera, et cetera, and to account for each different type of ceramic. What we've time to do is here is to take it a stage further, respecting that these are pots that were used in this house, but in this household, and chosen by this household, um, and that's what really we've been trying to disentangle. It's not quite as difficult as it sounds, although um, we've been stretching it things a bit. Flower pots, for ex example, are flower pots. There's no issue about what they were used for. Though I dare say some enterprising soul did find another use for them. They're all made in East Somerset, with the exception of a few dishes like this one down here, which was actually made at Verwood, probably because the East Somerset potteries um, just dwindled in their production towards the uh, end of the 18th century. Quite a, a variety of sizes, incidentally, note. But amongst them are also is pots like this, which is um, a jug. Its bottom has been knocked out of it, and it was intended to be hung by the handle with its mouth against the wall and uh, to serve as a nesting box. The squabs would have been taken out and either used as pets or eaten. Hence your blackbird pie. Um, and there's this... this Time, it is just these three sherds, which are a reminder that um, people did collect and uh, cherish potted plants in those days, especially bulbs. As you can see in this painting by a leotard of this, of this girl and her pot of hyacinths in a similar uh, tin glazed earthenware vessel. Now, what it means is that we can actually look at um, this as this kind of garden uh, that uh, would have been in existence at the back here in Wells was probably more like this um, lovely watercolour um, that's in the collection of Bristol City Museum and Art Gallery and depicts, depicts the backyard of uh, a house in St James's Square in Bristol. You won't find it now because the whole area was flattened to build Kitchen James Barton roundabout. But you will notice that there is a rack of um, potted plants along the right hand side here. And there is a hot house on the left for bringing on seedlings. Remember, this is this is the kind of date in the uh, mid to late 18th century that seedsmen were um, uh, working in places and advertising places like Bristol and running a mail order 
um, services. So you could you could buy a half an ounce of whatever seeds you wanted to um, bring on for yourself. The interesting thing is that this seems to have been the preserve of the mistress of the house and her daughters to manage. So it's as though the parterre here and the hothouse were extensions of the actual interior of the house, which they, of course, would manage. Incidentally, the, before we move on, the garden is long and thin, just like uh, Wells, and has a, a, a collection of fruit cheese um, down uh, one side towards the end. Pots like this are perhaps not, uh, thanks to Peter Breers and other similar souls, are probably possibly not um, such puzzles. Any household would have needed a method of storing food over the winter and um, processing food to ensure the household had a good supply of foodstuffs throughout the year. Here you can see the, these very large um, earthenware jars are designed mostly for that. It's a bit difficult to work out exactly how they were used. One suspects they were used for multiplicity purposes. But here we've got a salting pan for um, salting meat. And here a colander that uh, this one is actually made in Verwood um, for making cheese. But otherwise, a lot of these pans, you notice, have these big overhanging heavy rims of tying cloth over the top to keep weevils out. They are there to act as uh, good storage jars um, over the winter and would have been kept in a room on the north side of the house, which would have been primary purpose, would have been as a larder. Now, other pots are around as well. And this is a very unusual form, which I must confess I haven't seen it before. Again, it's made in East Somerset, um, as are most of these. I, I, and I should add here that it's the, been the research of Jens Anderson, Kevin Rollinson and myself over the past 10 years or so that's been able to identify, classify, characterise all these red earth and wear fabrics. Though there are some that we haven't, and I suspect they actually hail from Bristol. There is a reference to the pottery in Boot Lane in Bedminster having supplied various gentlemen with um, what they call brown wear in the um, latter half of the 18th century. So here we have a collection of pottery which we can be fairly, fairly confident belongs to the larder. But the interesting thing uh, that uh, is a little bit to, uh, of a going out on the limb is the concept that, yes, we've got lots of pottery, which Oliver will explain, um, that relate to the household, the upstairs bit, if you want to do it and put it in uh, kind of national trust terms. But there does seem to be a nexus of, of 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 pottery that is around the what I would call the servants' hall and what we have called the servants' hall, as exemplified by this lovely painting by Edward Bird, who was uh, one of the early members of the Bristol School of Artists, and is depicting a West Country kitchen. It's not only a place to cook in. It's also a place, as you see here, for the servants to gather, to talk, and to, um, and no doubt there's a, that is a nice piece of exaggeration that's going on here, and, and no doubt the soldier that you can see sitting on the table has an interesting tall table, tall, tall tale to tell as well. But this is the kind of context which we would expect in a household of this size at this date. And it may explain why we have um, tin glazed earthenware, which was very common in the late 17th, early 18th century. We only have about two dozen pieces that survive. And you can almost see that these, including this lovely jug, 
with the dancing Chinaman around uh, what looks like lettuce leaves. Um, these would have probably been hand-me-downs from an earlier age that would have found its way into this kind of setting. And, and most um, significantly, we very rarely have any um, illustrations of this kind of wear, yellow slipwear. This is a, a wet, one of those rare exceptions. It's a, um, an engraving in the British Museum of uh, the Cobbler's Hall, where his wife or a maid is actually at cooking over the range. And here you've got a nice um, slipwear dish up on the um, settle behind. These are incredibly common. There's hardly an 18th century site in Somerset that doesn't produce at least a little bit of this stuff. And quite a lot of sites produce masses of it. And it's found all the way around the coast of the Southwest Peninsula, as far as Christchurch, I think I found some um, way back in the 60s. Very distinctive. Very like um, some of the waste material found in Bristol. And in fact, um, Ollie and I are convinced that all this stuff is in fact Bristol made. How it was used, though, is interesting, isn't it? This is the kind of um, material that one would imagine the uh, downstairs servants hall dining of. And together with these cups, which Ken Barton actually recognised as being made in Bristol in his paper published in the Transactions of the Bristol and Gloucestershire Society back in um, 1961, these are, again, Bristol made. They're very often said in archaeological publications and elsewhere to be made in Staffordshire. But we're convinced uh, these are all good Bristol examples. And they include very highly decorated bits. But we haven't got more of this one. But this is actually um, a, an example of what is called jeweling, which would have, would have decorated the collar around underneath the rim of a cup like this. Now, quite, we, quite clearly, one has to imagine these being set aside alongside things like treen, uh, wooden platters, um, to complete the ensemble. And of course, those don't survive, unfortunately, in an archaeological context. But nevertheless, we have this vast quantity of, of 18th century slipwear, which certainly um, must form a part of that household. And the best explanation we could come up with is that it formed part of the equipment of the servants' hall. As does the salt case stoneware. This too is was identified in the uh, 1961 paper by Ken Barton as being made in Bristol. He identified wasters, um, and uh, these are almost certainly um, being made just up the road um, have found their way here too. But these again uh, are in sharp contrast, as you will see in a minute, to the wares being used upstairs. But finally, I just want to interject that it's important when you do got these vast collections of sherds to have a really good look at every single one. This tiny little fragment here is something completely different. It dates back to the 6th to the 5th century BC and hails from Attic Greece. Very, very fine. Almost certainly a part of a, a drinking cup of some sort, rather like this Kylix up here. And it poses the question, who would actually possess such a vessel? It's quite clearly something that wasn't a normal day-to-day -day use, but perhaps was uh, adorned a, a, a dresser as part of a collection that somebody had amassed from um, a relative, perhaps, who did, undertook the Grand Tour, um, which was a, quite a commonplace in the late 18th century. 
but it would also suggest somebody who had an interest as an antiquarian. And that too might explain other features. A nice little entry in the diaries of the Reverend John Skinner, who I'm sure you all have heard of as the rector of Kensington, uh, Camerton. He records visiting uh, with Richard Colt, Sir Richard Colt Hall, the famous antiquary from, from uh, Wiltshire, Starhead, and his surveyor, Mr. Crocker. He recalls meeting with Edward Spencer, one of our, our prime suspects, to try and solve the problem of the whereabouts of the Roman port of Adaxium. Oh, oh, excuse me. And so I pass over to Ollie before I sneeze myself to death. <laughs> right. I'm going to pick up from there and talk a bit more about, well, about the family and about, uh, in effect, upstairs. Um, and uh, David's provided me with a nice link to, um, I suppose, the, the, the fact that I, gradually as you begin to look at this stuff, you begin, you, you have to start to think about what on earth is it doing there? Um, but also who's involved. And you do, as with that shirt, begin to see uh, individuals within within the material. It's an enormous quantity. The the, the number of pots in, in the cellar and the associated pits from, from uh, 1820 is, well, we, we keep upping the number. It's 800 pots. It's Maybe it's 900 pots. Well, maybe it's a bit more than that. It just keeps, um, it, it, it's difficult to... Uh, to uh, to, to get a real handle on just how much there is. Um, but in terms of the history of the house, which Theresa Hall has done a great deal of work on, um, we're aware that um, there's a the, the um, cathedral and the house, they lease it out after about 1720. There are a series of tenants, lessees, living there. Um, it's not necessarily been easy to find out a great deal about them. Uh, in the earlier period, better in the later period. The pots, on the other hand, cover this range. David's already emphasised the fact that there are some 17th century objects there, but there are also objects that run right through the 18th century. Um, but there's nothing that post can uh, be seen to post-date 1820. Um, so we've got this very long range, but equally we've got a number of different people living in the house. So there has to be um, an explanation for it all coming together. And the more we've looked at this, the more the person who's there in 1820 or in 1816, uh, I should say, um, becomes our chief suspect. Um, and uh, if we go on to him, this is Edward Spencer. Um, and I think we have to assume that the material we're looking at is, in effect, the, the contents of his home. Um, now, Spencer was a surgeon apothecary, trained as a medic. Um, and um, having done so, um, sought out an opportunity um, to take over medical practice. And in 18, 1789, he came to Wells, uh, where he bought medical practice and the apothecary shop um, of Mr. Rock, uh, MD, um, and set up as a, as a, as a doctor. Um, he quite rapidly became involved in local event, local affairs um, and um, clearly had an interest in local politics. He was elected mayor in 1813 and, in fact, again in 1828. Um, he seems to have been... Um, uh, he, he, there was some family money. Um, he was doing well as a doctor. He invested his money in farmland in various areas, Cheddar and Shipham, Western Supermare, um, and latterly also in calamine mining on Mendip. We know that that came unstuck and he came unstuck and was declared bankrupt in 1816. There are some uh, uh, court documents and things that Teresa has found uh, which indicate that um, he was unable to recover his chattels, his belongings from the house when it was seized and the house was quite quickly sold I mean, in a matter of months. Uh, was the lease was sold on to Joseph Lovell Lovell, who was a, a local lawyer, um, and um, so we we are we know that the beginning of eighteen seventeen, this house is sitting here unoccupied with a lot of stuff in it. 
Um, Duncan Cameron has been working as the artist in residence on this project has, uh, after a lot of discussion with us has produced this um, portrait of Spencer we couldn't there, there must somewhere be a picture of him but we can't find an image um, but um, Duncan has created this image of him sitting in his apothecary's uh, shop or in his uh, doctor's uh, office um, cogitating on what to do with his spare cash um, I think we maybe thought he was a bit of a Bit of a spendthrift, but uh, maybe not. The 18th century was a difficult place to invest your money, I think. Um, but what becomes clear is that um, Lovell remodels the house. The house as we see it now has a Regency Gothic front. This is Lovell's work. He rips down bits of it. He knocks down outbuildings. It's a major reworking of the building. Um, and um, the logical conclusion of the archaeology is that the contents are still there, and Lovell simply says to the builders, get rid of it. There's no, no, never mind selling off things or anything else. Just get rid of it. Um, and um, it's that's also reflected in the way that what's in the cellar there are, it is ceramic, it's bone, it's um, uh, stone, it's glass. There is no metal. Um, you know, anything recycled has been removed. Um, there's some evidence of architectural objects being smashed in order to recover metal. Um, but uh, otherwise, it's all going in the cellar, everything. Um, in order to talk about the um, the things that are associated with the family, if you like, I've separated them out. Of th we've used the structure in the exhibition of separating these things out into groups. So we have, I'll talk about three categories. Um, one we're calling health and hygiene, and then dining, and then tea. That's the three activities, if you like, to talk about. Um, Spencer was a doctor. And uh, it's quite clear that some of the objects in the basement, um, in the cellar, have a con direct connection with that business. Um, the most prominent object is this beautiful uh, mid-18th century um, wet drug jar. It's lost its foot. It should have a, a cone-shaped foot to raise it up, obviously, a hand on the back. Um, and it would have held a... Um, um, uh, oh dear, Oxymel of Sills, which is a, a brew made out of a plant of a Scylla plant related to uh, uh, grape hyacinths, which was um, yeah, being used as a medicine. Um, they're also in that photograph, look at them in more detail, these small jars which um, are containing medicines of various kinds or, or, or such products, um, but interestingly are available in, um, in multiples. Um, there are also numerous household hygiene objects um, we've already talked about chamber pots and toothbrushes and such like. Um, the small storage jars are interesting. These are, uh, in the case of the ones on the left, the Jay Goldstone we've tracked down. He's Bath's first resident dentist who was working in Green Street in Bath between 17, 1744, 1776. But the business continued on for a long time after that. Perhaps these contain tooth powders or something like that. Um, as I say, the the business of them being there, being there being four of them, there being multiples of them, as with the Dr. Roberts um, Ormond's friends, suggests perhaps these are a stock, if you like, rather than rather than household consumption. Um, and uh, the um, and with the more domestic objects, um, we have lots and lots of chamber pots. They come in. Uh, creamware in this case they come in uh, stoneware they come in earthenware um, they come in tin glazed earthenware there's a variety of grades um, perhaps for different people in the, in the family this particular one with the elaborately decorated handles and the rib design um, we have a matching wash bowl to go with that and it just feels that little bit upmarket compared to some of the others um, toothbrushes uh, David referred to earlier these have um, local dentists, uh, bath dentists, names and addresses stamped on them. Um, I've lost my notes to give you the names for them. Um, the um, the earliest one is marked uh, Edgar Buildings Bath, which is a chap called um, Joseph Sigmund, who was um, a dentist in Bath in the very early 19th century, 1798 onwards. Um, there are two sizes of some of these two, perhaps some of them are children's ones. Curious object in the middle is the inside of a hairbrush, perhaps had a metal back originally. It's a slice of bone to hold the bristles. A knit comb down the bottom for dealing with your children with knits, as we do. <laughs> um, 
There are also stool pots to go with the uh, the piss pots, um, and uh, we have quite a number of these. But this one is a particular favourite. This is a miniature one. It's a six inch school pot, a stool pot um, for a small bottom, uh, and would have fitted into a um, a, a small um, uh, child's potty chair. Um, uh, so, we, and the, the presence of the children is an interesting thing that comes into these uh, these collections of objects. Um, and then one of the things which people have most enjoyed, uh, not least when we first stuck it together, but also uh, in the uh, museum uh, store, but also um, since with the exhibition, um, this intriguing thing. This is pearlware, which is later 18th century, early 19th century type of ceramic. <laughs> and it's the bowl from a Brahma patent flushing toilet. The first flushing toilets were patented in, the 17, uh, in 1775, Apparently it didn't work terribly well. And, it, and the Brahma patent is the one where they managed to make the S-bend, the U-bend work properly, which is slightly worrying what, what happened with the previous one. Um, and um, this would have been a quite a sort of expensive luxury object, quite a special object. It's a rather nice advert from the Nottingham newspaper um, for a plumber um, installing them, offering them to install them in 1800. Um, can't help feeling this is again something which relates to Spencer. That people were very worried about fumes and smells as as, as uh, causing ill health, and clearly the U this would have still flushed into a cesspit. But nonetheless, you would have been isolated from the act. Um, it would have had an elaborate plunger on the side, very much like nautical toilets. In fact, the type continued in use in shipping uh, rather than on land. Um, been searching for a parallel for this anywhere and um, be very pleased if somebody came up with one. But at the moment, most of the museums and collections which advertise that they own the oldest flushing toilet seem to be um, in the middle of the 19th century. This is really quite a remarkable object. Can't help feeling Spencer installed it perhaps uh, when he moved into the house in, in 1807. Um, we also have some shirts of another one here. We appear originally have had two. Um, uh, one for ladies, one for gents, perhaps. <laughs> um, on to dining. Um, the um, the cellar uh, has lots of parts of uh, numerous dinner services in Porstein and earthenware, um, with date dating from quite early in the eighteenth century through into the right through to the end of the uh, period of occupation. Um, and it's one of the things that makes one feel very clear that this is um, one family's possessions rather than a random collection of objects, you know, as, as you might find in a tip, um, because they're a very coherent history of changing taste in dining and indeed the tea wares in the same way with tea. One sees a kind of an overview of the middling sort, as they're called, um, uh, the, the, the reasonably well-offs um, tastes and um, choices um, that they might make for these sorts of functions. Um, clearly, as with uh, as David Member referred to before, the, the metalwares are missing, and so um, uh, the, the certain types of objects are missing here. We, 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 um, we talk about that in a moment, but um, always has to remember there are, there there will be uh, metal jugs, metal tureens. Um, cutlery, all sorts of things here which are missing. The, um, um, those, those things aren't there. What we're getting is the ceramic element in this case. Um, so if we look at some of these, um, the earliest um, Chinese porcelain plates that we have, the earliest dinner plates we have are these. Um, there are in fact half a dozen of these and they are they're matching plates in the sense that the forms, detailing, size, everything is exactly the same. Um, but there seem to be two of each pattern. So we're looking at a set of pairs of similar plates. These are Kangxi, they're Chinese, they're early 18th century, they might be 1700, 1720, something like that, maybe a bit earlier. Um, at a point where in the... Um, the East India Company, the importation of Chinese porcelain at this point is something which is, is steadily increasing, but there's a fairly um, um, elite market, if you like, for this sort of thing at that point. Um, the Chinese who have been producing a lot of ceramics for export in the earlier part of the 17th century um, have had various wars and are coming back into the export trade at this date. Um, and this sort of porcelain is often characterized by having, in effect, Chinese imagery on it, they're Western shapes, but the Chinese are kind of testing what the West might want. 
Um, so these things have a distinctly kind of um, Chinese view, the use of Ling Shi fungus and so on on these, um, the the um, garden rock, um, the rock garden pattern on the other one with the pierced stone, which is a classic Chinese sort of gardening motif. Um, they're, 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 there's a there's a Chinese taste. And sometimes regarded as some of the best made Chinese. I, I, yeah, anyway, I love these. Um, some of the, my favourite pieces, beautiful things. But these would be, we're talking about a time when um, the sort of people living in this house very often for for um, for their dinnerware, they would be using pewter, they'd be using metal, silver. Um, they, these things would be exotic extras, if you like. And perhaps I suspect they would have spent more of their time on the dresser than on the dinner table. Maybe that's why they're still there 100 years later to go in the bin. Um, British potters, English potters, Staffordshire potters um, were keen to compete with both with imported ceramics, but also with um, attempts, um, yeah, English attempts to make porcelain. Um, and the uh, one of the largest assemblages of material within the pottery here is creamware. This is um, high quality earthenware. Um, it's uh, designed originally in um, in Staffordshire, probably in the middle of the 18th century. Um, uh, uh, the shapes are very closely related to the sorts of shapes you see, at least for plates and things, in pewter. So they're they're quite directly trying to replace the pewter with something fresh. Um, and this is this is. Um, also producing a very wide range of shapes, so they're replacing other things as well. Um, here we've got um, some uh, a selection of pieces. We'll look at some more in the next slide. Particularly, um, uh, notice the the salt on the tray there. There's a spoon in there, a little salt spoon in the salt. Rather nice to put those two pieces together. That is the only piece of cutlery we have um, from the whole collection, um, and uh, we're quite pleased with that. It's not silver; it's um, it's some kind of uh, alloy. Um, but the other thing with the creamware is it's virtually all cream. There are some brown ones. There are a tiny number of pieces with decoration on, very minimal. It's all very plain. And this, I think some people responding to the show felt, felt this is rather surprising. You look at um, uh, museum collections of creamware and you see lots of stuff with uh, brightly coloured hand painted decoration on it. The fact is, when we look at this sort of period archaeologically, this is what we tend to see. People enjoyed and consumed plain creamware in large quantities and the stuff that got kept and is now in museums is the stuff that um, was kept because it was the pretty bits if you like it's the special pieces it's also perhaps tea wares um, but um, this is coming back to what David was saying about the the um, this collection all these pots belong in the house so when those things uh, you're, you're seeing the viewpoint of the family who are here um, and perhaps there's a certain conservative and conservatism, austerity about some of the material that's here. Just a selection of those in the um, 18th century dinner dining. But the uh, conventions of dining become quite elaborate. We've got some table setting suggestions here for two removes. A remove is a course of mixing desserts or what we would regard as desserts with meat dishes with soups all on the table at once. Um, and the creamware potters were particularly keen on devising all sorts of exotic shapes to um, manage all the different requirements of this kind of um, table. Um, so this is just a selection of some of the pieces which we have um, uh, here um, here at Wells. So we have a rather fine uh, tureen on the top left, um, a salad, um, the, the um, crimped edged piece in the middle, which is... Uh, um, they designed it described in the, there are period catalogues from the potters and this is described specifically as a salad um on the uh, bottom left this little uh, sauce serving bowl um, has an attached um saucer underneath it they're fixed together so that will take your spoon um, resting at the side so you can pass it around the table um the um dish with a drainer in it these are described in the catalogues specifically as fish drainers although obviously you could Drain other meats and so on on them, um, and we have quite a number of these in different patterns um, and with the fitted dishes for them. On the other side, I've got a slight problem with having the screen obscuring the top one on the side. <laughs> Sorry, um, what have I got? It's disappeared. Ah, lost it. Um, the the um, 
Oh, sorry, big pun. Um, and on the right, um, uh, an object we we um, found amongst the plant pots relatively recently, um, which is a um, uh, a spode uh, terracotta wine cooler. So um, the business of chilling wine in ice we might regard as a, a kind of modern thing. These are specific kind of early nineteenth century object, and this one with a nice grapevines draped around it um, is uh, a, a, a rather. Um, Unusual and interesting object, telling again, telling you something about the eating habits of of the family here. We have a a, a wine bottle seal, um, which is actually in the main gallery of the museum, which has um, the name Constantia Vine um, on the seal. Constantia is the first major winery in uh, Cape Town, um, founded in the late seventeenth century um, and still trading today. Um, and uh, this would have been quite an expensive, uh, what we would call a pudding wine. Um, and uh, so clearly somebody would enjoyed their uh, enjoyed fine wines as well as the cheap stuff. Whether they chilled them in, in these things, I'm not quite sure. We we'll have to investigate the finer points of how you consume those kinds of things. Porcelain tableware. Um, Chinese porcelain tableware in the main in this collection is from the later part, latter part of the 18th century. And um, there are at least two services, which you can see on the dinner table on the on the right here. This emphasizing the quantity of pottery here, which which is completely almost completely reassemblable. Um, you know, quite a number of these big serving dishes, as well as um, uh, presentation dishes like the uh, one you saw earlier with the cranes on, but also sets of dinner plates, side plates. Uh, and so on, these octagonal shapes, which are very much Western taste. The later 18th century, lot of porcelain is very much, um, I, I think one could talk about globalization. The 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 um, the East India Company buyers, the European buyers are very specific at what they want, the shapes, patterns, designs. Um, and um, so these things become very much um, uh, in entirely European taste. Um, and, and they become very familiar. In actual fact, the range of forms is much more limited here relative to the, the um, uh, creamware ones uh, on the whole. Um, but um, the... Um, am I doing for time here? I don't know. Okay, I'm doing right. Um, just to make a, a, um, a, a point about that really here. One of the things that happens in... Um, 1780s, uh, people have already devised processes for printing on ceramics, but the invention of the underglaze uh, transfer printing process uh, changes uh, the field a lot in ceramic history. And um, the uh, as creamware becomes perhaps a tired project, the uh, industrial potters devise something which is now known as pearlware, where they make the body whiter, they use a pale blue glaze, and they hand paint onto it, but they also begin to print onto it. And they create something which they feel is, is really is a strong competitor for Chinese porcelain. Um, here we have a, a, a net pattern spode plate, um, uh, 1800, 1820. Um, there are a few pieces of a service of these amongst the material from the cellar. Um, but it's interesting to place that with its pagoda designs in the um, in the uh, cartouches on that, both on the main body of it and on the rim, um, with the large Chinese export dish on the other side, um, which has um, a conventionalized garden pattern, not entirely unrelated to the early 18th century ones, but the border pattern, if one's familiar with, if one can remember the kind of standard willow pattern plate, whilst that's not an exact reproduction, um, it's it's a Staffordshire border almost. It's almost as if the Chinese potters have been given the Staffordshire pot to work from. Um, it's it's uh, um, in effect become a European product, I think. Um, it's uh, it's interesting, ceramic history wise. Um, that uh, takes us on to tea. And the interesting thing about tea is the way that the, the material culture of it is um, quite different from dinner. Um, and one of the reasons for that, I think, is that the uh, when it comes to dining, there's a set of rules and uh, processes and conventions that already exist. Tea and taking tea um, is something which is new. An exotic activity comes with uh, a requirement for new objects to consume it. So the East India Company bring in the tea, but with it, they supply the cups, the saucers, the necessary paraphernalia that goes with it. The whole thing becomes an exercise. But not just about tea, about coffee and chocolate as well, um, which impact are the... Uh, uh, tend to come in earlier 
Uh, in the collection here for the un, un, in the um, amongst the earliest material, we have this intriguing collection of uh, pieces of Kangxi porcelain or Yongcheng porcelain um, from very early in the 18th century. Um, and these tea bowls um, are what are called Batavian um, style or Batavian ware with this brown exterior, which was fashionable at that date, becomes fashionable again in the middle of the 18th century. But these are, these are early pieces and have Kangxi marks underneath them to date them from a Chinese porcelain point of view. Um, so as to be clear about the, the date. They're particularly interesting that when the background is barely visible on that one, but the one in the foreground, you can see the enamel decoration on this. This is very specific style of decoration applied in London around 1710. And from a, you know, it's not the kind of thing you find in archaeology at all. These are art objects. These are objects you'll find in museums. On the whole, archaeology turns out the ordinary thing is not the fancy things, but these would have been expensive personal purchases from the workshop in London, very likely. Um, and these would be associated particularly with coffee drinking, probably. The other pots, the uh, cappuccines, as they're sometimes called, little handle cups, um, which at that period were, were um, particularly associated with, with chocolate. You do have to wonder why these are the, what these have been, are these hand-me-downs? Or, or are we back to that idea of, you know, Spencer the antiquarian? Are we talking about collected objects? Um, Early 18th century, it's a lovely painting, which um, we've been loaned by the Goldsmith Company, um, dates from around 1725. And we have uh, tea um, and coffee possibly as well being consumed by um, the uh, uh, this family. Rather nice, uh, they're in their kind of relaxed uh, um, at home clothes the the gentleman is wearing his his uh, he's covering his bald shaved head with a with his mop cap and he's wearing a um, uh, a house coat um and they're using uh, pewter or silver um they've got a sugar basin on the left and then a slot bowl and so on and then their their choice porcelain cups and saucers which they're rather showing off in these complicated finger positions um to uh, uh, uh drink the, to drink from um uh, Tray of teaspoons to show they're using sugar. Um, they, um, there's bread and butter, which became a convention with, with tea drinking. Um, I like the fact the children are breaking the rules. The little girl is holding a cup in a much more practical way, and the child in the front is licking the butter off their bread, as, as small children do. I mean, they just do, don't they? The business of a tea set, a tea service, is something that evolves out of that. And we have amongst our kind of most treasured finds, really, is this almost complete um, uh, Mandarin style Chinese enamel porcelain tea set dating from the 1770s. Um, we have kind of half a teapot, um, half a slot bowl, the lid of a sugar basin, um, I think about th uh, four cups and three cups and four saucers, um, the bread and butter plate um, up on the top left, and there's a lid for a lidded jug or for a um, Tea caddy. Um, this lovely painting um, in the um, Getty um, shows a virtually identical tea set um, having been uh, used and set aside. The servants are going to take it away and do the washing up. Um, and you've got the bread and butter on the plate in the middle and so on, all the paraphernalia associated. Um, it's delightful to be able to put those two things together. Um, latterly, um, there are a few pieces of English porcelain amongst the collection, but on the whole, um, that's very small. There's a Worcester porcelain bowl in the mid left there. Um, and there's a bow, uh, broad cup in the foreground. But these are these are unusual things, basically, in terms of the collection. Um, at the top um, are a group of, um, uh, sort of general purpose tea bowls. Um, uh, there's a lot of these, um, all kinds of quality. These are pots which, interestingly, you find archaeologically in things like inn and tavern groups, coffee shop groups. They're quite um, routine objects. Um, but latterly, um, as um, as with the dinnerwares, the Staffordshire pottery start to come into play within tea. Um, and in the foreground here, we have um, a range of uh, different pieces from the subject. There is at least one um, transfer printed tea set, um, uh, the uh, blue and white one in the center there, um, three cups and a saucer. Um, this one's interesting. This is early transfer printing. It's probably dates from the perhaps from the 1790s. Um, the pattern is copying uh, one of the earliest um, 
transfer printed patterns produced by um, Coffley um, around 1780. So it's uh, um, uh, it, it would have been quite a fashionable object. Um, the um, so they're moving with the times as they. Uh, uh, Nice subgroup within these are, and this is coming back to the children, because I, I love uh, finding the children. We also have parts of two tea sets um, in uh, hand-painted pearlware, um, uh, which are clearly designed for children. Um, one with the classic uh, little um, house pattern on, the other with the floral pattern on. There's also a single um, creamware uh, toy cup there. Um, these and um, the... Um, uh, tea becomes something which is associated very much. It's a kind of women's activity. Um, it's part of the kind of female part of the household by um, by the middle of the 18th century. The idea of toy tea sets has been kind of a lot of toys seen as being educational. So these are perhaps about uh, teaching the young, the girls of the family about the rituals of uh, social behavior as much as simple objects to play with. Um, the other thing in the, there are two of these small kind of child sized tankards. Uh, or, or mugs, um, particularly taken with the one in the foreground, which um, uh, it has uh, what appears to be part of a prayer, something along the lines of may the Lord always, something like that. Um, probably made around one of the very few pieces of enameled cream where we have, and probably made around 1770. It's interesting purely to speculate that, that um, Edward Spencer would have been about the right age to have received that as a christening present or something like that. Perhaps that's a hand-me-down of his own. Um, to, um, sorry, I'm clicking the wrong thing. Um, what have I done? I've gone the wrong way. Um, to round off, the, there are a few pots um, which um, look very different initially when one looks through this. Um, and these are the things which must have gone in the cellar more or less brand new. Um, the, uh, we have next to no teapots. And this is primarily because most of this sort of stuff was probably um, metal. Um, and this willow pattern teapot is, is the, the willow pattern has got the two birds, the two doves uh, at the top, which is a sure sign of the beginnings of the willow pattern proper. Uh, must date from around 1810, 1820, um, and um, is uh, um, we don't have any other pieces to go with it, so maybe it's a, a lone piece. The um, Ridgeway's plate um, has a, a printed label on the back saying Stone China, and this would have been a new, very new product um, in 1816 when the cellar was being filled um in that case there are other pieces suggesting that there was a, a service of some kind um from the, of those as well so uh, at the point where they're chucking everything out they really are chucking everything out they're chucking out the new pots along with the uh, along with the old ones um it's it's amazing um spencer lost his stuff but he's back in action and he's being uh, he's standing for election as mayor of Wells again in 1828, which is roughly when uh, the Lovell Lovells finally finished their building work and moved into the house. Um, so there you go. That's what I have to say. <laughs> that was so fascinating, Ollie. Um, and David as well. Now, hopefully we'll get the pair of you back on screen there. Look at that. Fantastic. Oh, yeah. Three of us together. <laughs> well done, everybody. Now, don't forget anybody out there in webinar land, if you want to ask some questions, do, don't forget to ask in, in the uh, chat button um, any questions that you'd like to ask Ollie and David now, and I'll I'll go through them and, and see what's what. We've got quite a lot of questions come in so far. Um, somebody would like to know... Has any evidence of contents in the pottery, e.g. food and plates and bowls or plants um, or plant fibre in the plant pots? So have you got any evidence of uh, of any plants being found in your plant pots? No, they ha it hasn't sparked. It's all been cleaned, yeah. <clears throat> uh, there are some pots with uh, with distinct signs of burning on. Some of those slipware dishes are burnt on the back. Some of the mugs are charred. There's yeah. a nice king that's got burning on it. But um, uh, I guess there is maybe some opportunity to look at lipids and so on on those. Yeah, yeah. And I just wondered if you could just briefly explain the difference between all the different sorts of, of ceramic types, you know, the creamware, the porcelain and the, the pearlware, because... Uh, 
I think that might be interesting to people to know the difference between those sorts. Um, and porcelains are extremely high fired, so they're almost kind of glass like. Um, those pieces, I mean, you can cut your fingers on the shirts from the cellar. They've been in the ground for 200 years, but there's the glaze edges will be razor sharp. Um, and they're they're also kind of impervious to staining and so on. So they they stay very fresh. Those those most of those plates and cups and things, um, they're 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 in beautiful condition in that sense. Um the creamware is is um is a um, manufactured clay body um, using uh, clays from Devon and Cornwall blended together um, to produce a, a light fine body, a little bit of iron to give it that warm color. Um, very specifically designed as a fresh, I guess, I mean, a lot of um, Delftware's earlier pottery look quite coarse. They're trying to send something fresh, sharp. They're quite hard fired if they're good quality ones. Um, and they're distinctly replacing the they have this aim of replacing pewter. Um, so it's shiny and smooth. The stuff we've got is made by quite, we have at least five or six different uh, makers' marks on the back, most of which are not identifiable. Um, and you can see looking at them together, particularly in daylight, the quality varies quite a lot. So there must be, you do get the impression of people replacing their pottery regularly. So some creamware is quite high quality, particularly the Wedgwood pieces, there's quite a lot of Wedgwood. Um, but other things are, are really quite crumbly and horrible. Um, was it a local thing or was this found all over Britain, the creamwares? It's being mass produced in huge quantities in uh, particularly, uh, well, particularly Stoke, but Leeds, Derbyshire, Bristol. Um, some of that pottery is probably coming from Bristol Rings pottery, which um, was in Bristol at that day, probably produced quite a bit of it. Um, but it's being, it's being, um, people like Wedgwood are experts in marketing and he's, he's shipping it outside the country. It's going to Russia and um, Germany and wherever. Okay. When I used to do lots of archaeological illustration, as you know, and what always fascinated me was that in what I think of as medieval pottery was mostly just seemed to be just sort of jugs or bowls. And then suddenly you get to sort of the 16th, 17th, 18th century, and they're making all sorts of stuff in every single shape, size, dimension, more than one handle, 10 handles on a pot. What on earth happened to society that we could suddenly feel free to make all these different styles of pottery? Why um, were they held back in the past from doing these things? Two things. One is the change in the status of ceramics from being an earthy thing for peasants and everybody else eats off metal. And then the other one is cooking. Mm. Our tastes in food and cooking change enormously from the sort of 16th century onwards. And whether it's French sources or or in the 18th century, starting to get interested in Indian cooking. Um, uh, you know, the, 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 the influence of people going to... Well, I guess it's, you know, in, there's a fascinating book called The Raj at Table about the history of British Indian cooking and interrelationship. Um, and um, we, we've got all these interesting ideas. We make ragouts and things, and, and we want sauce ah. pots. It's just cook sauce in little skillets. We want sauce pots to serve it in. Um, and, um, yes, food. So people are eating different foods. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, how interesting. And then presumably with social dining and things like that. I mean, they must have had social dining in medieval times didn't they or was it just different i think uh, it, was, it was very highly formalized mm. in medieval times yeah Even at the lowest levels of society they had very very ritualized approaches to to food yeah peter Brees um, characterized it as a medieval peasant would be horrified at our manners today particularly in relation to fast food so the mm -hmm. idea of, uh, you know, you get from early films of Henry VIII chucking chicken bones over his shoulder is just no, 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 no. It was all very highly ritualised. The longer we go, the further we go on in the post-medieval period, the more relaxed we become about the way we eat and the way we interact with other people. Because eating, of course, um, food is expensive, it's valuable. The way you share it with other people becomes uh, much more relaxed.
that's really interesting, isn't it? Uh, it? Fascinating that we're all becoming much more relaxed about our eating habits and, you know, the thought that we can now sit out in the streets and, I mean, it's not unusual to see people eating in the streets, eating hamburgers um, in, in a way that presumably wasn't acceptable in the past. Yes, you, you could eat, you could have your um, midday lunch in the fields, but even that was a... Um, was a uh, governed by fixed rituals, which hands you used for which purpose, for example, as it is still in quite a lot of the, the world to this day. Yeah. We're absolutely barbaric when our food manners. <laughs> I'll consider that, David. <laughs> 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 thinking thinking about the um the different potteries do you know if they actually traded different types of pot between themselves or were they just selling their own pots uh who is i mean I, I don't know i was thinking you know um okay so supposing they made one sort of pottery in uh bristol did they trade with other people making different sorts of pottery in dorset I was well, wondering, maybe you've got Verwood pots that are appearing in 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 a Bristol pottery. You know, were they actually selling these things, or were they just selling their own stuff? I think you've got to differentiate between the red wares and the um, the finer wares. I mean, somebody like Elizabeth Ring, for example, had a wide range of of um, pot um, of wares that she was selling, all very fine quality. As, uh, didn't she, Ollie? Yes, yeah, she had, but her advertisements imply that she could get you anything. Um, she'll sell you uh, Chelsea porcelain or, or Staffordshire creamware, or, or she's got the pottery out the back, uh, the family pottery's out the back, so she can... Um, okay, yeah. Uh, there are also references to Wedgwood having deals with other makers where if he can't fill an order, Enoch Wood will supply the extra bits. So they actually did... This is the, the, the finer sorts of pots, not the earthenwares. Creamwares and things. That he, yeah, he's with, with creamware. He, he's got other people lined up, so if he hasn't got enough plates for a big order, um, he can buy them in. Ah, but, uh, brilliant. Okay, somebody would like to know, how was the jeweling effect achieved um, on the uh, slipware pots? Slip trading. Uh, Sorry, David, yeah. Sorry, that's quite, quite simple. The, on top of the... Uh, the, the pot is covered in a white slip. Then on top of that, there are tiny little spots of brown slip applied. Then on top of that, there are little white spots of, of slip applied. And so you get the jeweling effect. Yes, yes. And and were there um, specific potteries in, in Bristol that made the slipware pots? Or did all the potters make slipware pots? Uh, well, certainly making is making yellow slip where seemed to be far, rather general certainly in the earlier part of the 18th century yeah yeah the, uh, the the problem is that nobody actually owns up to making yellow slip where um it's partly because i think in the early 18th century a lot of people were still uh describing themselves as galley pot makers and galley pots is associated with tin glazed earthenware making what what is a galley pot? Storage uh, jar. Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, most of the Tingay's pots that survive are not those highly decorated things. They're little ointment jars and uh, storage jars that we find in kitchens. We've yes. got some of those, but they are there. Yeah, they were nice. Those little um, ointment jars, weren't they? What was the poor man's friend medicine? What was that? Do you know? You can, if you go to Bridport Museum, they've actually managed to find the recipe when the um, when the the shop was being cleared up, and uh, you can see you can see exactly what it went into the poor man's recipe. I wouldn't recommend it necessarily. It cured, no. it cured everything. I'm sure it did. <laughs> that probably even cured you of life. <laughs> yes, what I thought. Goodness me. 
So we've got something on dentistry here. Um, any theories as to how the dentistry stuff from Bath came to be there? Um, did Spencer dabble in dentistry as a sideline or would Bath dentists maybe have been itinerant? That's a thought, isn't it? I think it's a difficult one, though, isn't it? I mean, with the Goldstone jars, because there are quite a few of them, it sort of you do wonder whether they are things that were on the shelf in the apothecary shop. They're a bit early for Spencer, but we know he bought the shop and its contents. So they could be things that were simply old stock sitting on the shelf. That's most likely that, that Dr. Rock was selling earlier. Um, with the toothbrushes and things, I mean, one has to assume that those are family use. Um, and that they have been visiting dentists in Bath. I mean, Bath and Bristol, they're two main places to go to buy china or porcelain and indeed to go to see a dentist. I don't think there's a resident dentist. Um, the other chap, I've forgotten his name. Is it Warren? There's three dentists involved. Is it Goldstone's mm. first dentist in Bath, isn't he? Um, and then there's Sigmund, and then there's the third one, um, there were three on the toothbrushes. I can't remember the name of the third one. But um, it, we've got his address and the next door neighbouring building is a dentist to this day. Um, but, uh, but yeah, they're probably the dentists the family went to. What did they make their toothbrushes out of? Their bone and boar bristle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad I've got a modern toothbrush. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, question here. Uh, so not finding metalware in the cellar, um, except for the spoon, does that suggest that they were easy to sell on or do you think the family took them with them? From the from Teresa's um, paper evidence, it sounds as if the family weren't able to recover any of their belongings. But whether that's true or not, obviously we're not sure, but that appears to be what happened. What we do know is that, um, well, hey, it's not there, but also the toilet's quite interesting because if you look at the um, the diagram for installing a toilet, the ceramic bit is a small part, really, of an elaborate metal contraption with a water tank and everything else. And the it's very clear with the toilet, somebody's taken a blunt instrument and hacked off all the points where the metal parts would have attached. So that suggests somebody pretty ruthlessly recovering metal for recycling. Yeah. Um, so I think you've got probably it may be the family got some stuff back, but everything else the builders have um or somebody has has well really knowing, knowing how hard it is to actually extract metal anyway, it, it, they would have thought of it as an extremely precious commodity, I would have thought. I think that yeah. for the diagram, that toilet would have there would have been a fair few um you know, a hundred way of, but well, a bit of a heck of a lot of metal to recover. Yeah. Uh, was it entirely made of metal or was, was some of it made out of timber? I just wondered if the ceramic, the, the pot at the top um, for holding the water might have been wood. Right. You've got the mechanism that operates the um, flush um, and a pull handle on one side to operate it, just like a marine. Yeah. Then you've got your pipe up the back of the cistern above. And you also need a pump because in order to make it work, you haven't got a forced water supply as we have. So a servant has to pump water up. Sorry, I'm doing pumping actions beside me. I should be doing them here. Shouldn't I? <laughs> a servant has to water into the cistern to make it work. Um, they must have, I mean, I think they would be a bit of an unfamiliar piece of equipment if we tried to use them nowadays. Surely much easier to use a potty. I mean, surely. <laughs> what a palava. I refuse to use them. Yeah. <laughs> Can I ask, uh, did the Chinese people like the ceramics that they were exporting to Britain? No. This was definitely designer made for the export market. As of years of, of experience of making and export export goods, they were exporting to the Middle East. Um, you know, if, before they were exporting to Europe, their early exporting is to Portugal and then more widely in Europe. And, and um, no, they, they would have regarded it as their export stuff. Yeah, uh, not not to their taste at all. Uh, I, this argument that we're really looking at globalization and, and uh, um, uh, the manufacturing being something that the Europeans are outsourcing in a, in the way that we would do nowadays. You know, Wedgwood stuff is made in um, Bangladesh or China or whatever, and we see that as being normal. Our iPhones are made in 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 China. Um, in effect, it's exactly the same thing going on. The, the, by the time you get to those later Chinese porcelain services. The taste, the design, the decoration is all being stipulated from here. 
um, and then the order is being sent off and it being supplied back again. Um, yeah. Yeah, we're getting towards the end of the question, but I want to fit this one in. Um, if the Chinese ware was important to London, important to London, how would it then be distributed around the provinces? Do you want to take that one, David? Like, oh, on. okay. um, yeah. It was the um, the whole lot was sold off in London by not only the uh, East India Company but uh, the people who were uh, shipping this as private cargo and there was a great deal of that that would have in turn made its way into the provincial sellers who did basically the tour of the markets around the major provincial sellers these in turn you could either go to directly or local there was also almost certainly some local dealers in wells that would have um, tapped into those supplies as well so you can see that there is a network of um of retailers right the way across the country that would distribute um, this uh, very specialist type of um, pottery. And indeed, um, Ollie's sorted out some nice um, adverts of the kinds of people who are selling uh, not only China ware, but mixed up with quite a lot of other different types of ware at places like the St. James's Fair in Bristol. The two fairs in Bristol were regular points that dealers from London who'd bought in bulk would come down and take over rooms over a pub and spread the whole lot out and offer to sell wholesale or to private customers and advertise with price lists. Um, but then it's not just porcelain. It, yes, it's all the kind of East India Company goods. It's it's um, uh, oh, I don't know, novelty ivory and uh, textiles and all sorts of things, Indian goods as well. Um, uh, rattan matting, all, all kinds of all terms. Um, but actually, at the at the kind of shopkeepers level, it's often tied to the tea trade and the the, um, uh, the uh, so that you get um, a tea dealer will also sell you teapots and things at the same time. See, I can remember going to a pot fair in my youth, and it was just full of people selling ceramics of different sorts. It wasn't very glamorous because it was all quite modern in the nineteen sixties, but it was still called the pot fair. Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. We've got one last question here. Intrigued by the apple roaster. Are there any other known examples, and do you know how they were used? Well, the the, the uh, straight answer is no. I don't know of any other exact um, copies of that particular form of apple roaster. But apple roasters are not uncommon. Um, there's one in the museum of some. Well, there used to be one in the museum of Somerset. That had kind of mushrooms around the, uh, the the side of a tray. The idea is that you put your apples on on the shelves or on the perches, and shovel embers from afar, push it into the side of a fire, and your apples would roast to your satisfaction. Wouldn't damage the ceramics then. No, well, no, it won't, um, because the. The fires are not hot enough to do that. They're yeah. hot enough to cook, to cook the apples nice and slowly. Yeah, it's quite a skill, isn't it, Nat? Yeah. So I think they, they, they are, they look to us, our eyes, rather novelty pieces of pottery. Um, and obviously a household wouldn't have certainly more than one. But there seem to be quite a lot of different designs. Yeah. But um, whether they were actually particular to a, a maker or not, I don't know. That uh, the what the Wells one is certainly made by the Somerset Potteries again. Fantastic. Well, I think we've come to the end of our question time now. Um, how long does the exhibition go on for? Eleventh of April. On to the 11th of April, so everybody's got oh, quite a while yet to go and have a look at it. And it really is well worthwhile at Wells Museum. And don't forget everybody else, uh, our webinar will be uh, recorded and will be available on the YouTube channel. So could thank I, you very much. Sorry, could, David. I, could I also add that there is a, a an archaeological pottery workshop that um, Ollie and I are running on the 6th of April. April, over at Wells. Yes, over at Wells. <laughs> well, okay, yeah, smashing. And that's what, all day? And how will people find out about that? 
Thank you all chosen. A later pottery research group. Uh, is it advertised on their website? I don't know. Yes. Okay. Well, we'll do our best. We could probably put it onto the, the, the Sounds website for you if you like. But it should be there already, but um, okay. I don't know whether it is. I couldn't find it last time I looked. Oh. <laughs> we yeah. do our best. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, David. Anybody, anything else you need to say? No. no that's all right. <laughs> right. <laughs> thank you both very much and speak to you again soon. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Lovely. Nice okay. Bye. Bye. Okay, thank you very much, David and Ollie. That was really good and really well-informed information. So don't forget, uh, the next Sans we webinar will be on the 14th of March, and that will be completely different, and it'll be about the refurbishment and replanting of the Castle Garden um, right next to Taunton Museum. So that's our next webinar uh, on the 14th of March. Um, on the 20th of March, um, we've got our first live talk at the Wyndham Hall, where Mary Syro will be talking about booze, blood and baskets, which I think is something about elections. So that's a live talk on the 20th of March. I think that's next Wednesday uh, by Mary Syro live at the Wyndham Hall. And the following um, Saturday, it'll be the Sands Archaeology Day. That's the 23rd of March, and that's at Tintin Hull Village Hall. Information about that is, is on the Sands website. Um, there are other little events coming up. Um, Bacchus, which I think is Bath Archaeology, and they're having a talk on um, the 16th of March, and that is about Avalon Archaeology Recreating the Past by Dr Brunning. Uh, Harp Tree History Society on the 27th of March are having a talk about the history of the surname by Professor Richard Coates. And Tintin Hull Local History Group are having a talk on the 27th of March as well about the parish registers. And that's by Ted Udall. Um, I think that's about it, actually. So thank you for coming again. And uh, thank you to the webinar team working away behind the scenes, Nathaniel, Alan and Tony. And we look forward to seeing everybody again on the 14th of March. Speak to you all again soon. Bye bye. <laughs>